You're all welcome to the Bible study for tonight. And tonight we are taking a look at another special study, important study, a direct continuation from where we stopped last time in our study in the book of Matthew. We are looking at Matthew chapter 26 from verse 6 to verse 13, a real true event that took place in the ministry of Jesus Christ. And it has a powerful message for every one of us that is alive today. And as we go through this study, I want you to keep your minds open, your heart open, because God will use this story to bless me. He will use it to bless you. He will use it to open my eyes. He will use it to transform me and to transform you. And if you are ready to receive from the Lord, today can mark a turning point in your life in Jesus' name. Uh, in Matthew chapter 26, verse 6, we are told, Now when Jesus was in Bethany, in the house of Simon the leper, there came to him a woman having an alabaster box of very precious ointment and poured it on his head as he sat at meat. And when his disciples saw it, they had indignation, saying, To what purpose is this waste? For this ointment might have been sold for much and given to the poor. When Jesus understood it, he said unto them, Why trouble ye the woman? For she had wrought a good work upon me. For ye have the poor always with you, but me uh, ye have not always. For in that she had poured this ointment upon my body, she did it for my burial. Verily I say unto you, wheresoever this gospel shall be preached in the whole world, there shall also, uh, there shall also this that this woman had done be told for a memorial of her. What a wonderful story. What a wonderful thing that took place here. We don't know the name of this woman. It is not mentioned here in this particular uh, uh, text that we've read here. She's just known as a woman, a woman that poured her love upon Jesus Christ, that demonstrated her love upon Jesus Christ. It seemed like, in fact, to some people, for, to some of the disciples, it was uh, something that drew their indignation. They were angry. Why should such a things like this be done? But God sees things differently from how human beings see them. And because of the way God saw it, and because of what Jesus Christ understood about it, Jesus Christ made a pronouncement. He says, Verily I say unto you, wheresoever this gospel shall be preached in the whole world, not just in Israel, not just in the Middle East, but in the whole world, this very thing that this woman has done will be mentioned for her, uh, for a memorial unto her. And thousands of years have passed, over 2,000 years since this was done, and we are still hearing about it. You know, as I studied while I was preparing the outline to share with us, as I read over it, meditated over it, a number of things came to my mind, which I want to just touch on some of them, because if we really understand it and grasp it and run with it, our life will be different. And what we are doing for God will last unto eternity in Jesus' name. You see, what this woman did was a demonstration of love. The Bible tells us in 1 John chapter 4, verse 8, that God is love. And because God is love, he greatly delights. He is greatly delighted. He loves it. He appreciates it whenever he finds his children manifesting love because that makes those children of his to act in his character like children, like parents, like father, like son, like mother, like daughter, like parents, like children. God is love. He loves to see his children walking in love. And whenever he sees an act of love, he appreciates it. It touches his heart. It draws his attention. He, 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 he honors it and he rewards it. 
The Bible makes it tells, uh, tells us in John chapter 3, verse 16, that God himself demonstrated love because the, the word of God tells us there, God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. Love gives. And when a person loves, that love will be moved to give. The gift may be small, it may be big. It may be uh, 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 something that is just notional, but the person will give. It, it will give out of love because love gives, love like to give. And God himself demonstrated that by giving his own uh, son. When there is true love, you will also find out that no gift is considered too big. No gift is considered too much. No gift is considered a waste because the person that loves that other person wants to please that individual. He wants to make that individual happy. And therefore, uh, uh, you will find that this person will not consider anything a waste. Now, this passage tells us of a woman that brought a alabaster box of oil. That was a precious oil. In fact, in other passages where a similar thing is mentioned, it talks about that it was like one a, a worth a year's wages. Think about what a person will earn by working for a whole year. Well, well no, even if you calculate it in terms of minimum wage in UK, it will run into thousands of pounds. Uh, imagine somebody bringing uh, what uh, would cost him a year's wage and come to this house and pour it on the feet of the Lord Jesus Christ. Poured, uh, oh, sorry, was pouring it on his head. Well, it was something precious, something expensive. This is why the disciples were indignant, were, uh, indignant and said, why is this waste? This is something worth a large amount of money. Why just come and pour it like that? They thought it was a waste. No, you are not wasting when you are giving something to God. You are not wasting when you are giving to God's children. You are not wasting when you are doing something for the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. This woman was not doing this for any ulterior motive. He was not doing it because he wanted to get anything from Jesus Christ. He was not, she was not doing it because of uh, uh, maybe he wanted to become a friend of Jesus Christ or any of those things. No, that wasn't her motive. Her motive was pure, pure love. He wanted to show the appreciation he had for the Son of God, for the Lord Jesus Christ. And he brought this box of ointment a box of ointment that could have fetched her a lot of money and he poured it on the Lord Jesus Christ. Was this woman a church goer? Was she in the synagogue? We are not told much about this woman. In fact, in other places where something similar to this was done, the woman was described as an harlot. And that means such a person would have been uh, 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 not associated with the things of God. But you see, when God touches the heart of an individual, when God touches the life of a person, that touch of God transforms that individual and makes that individual to become uh, uh, who many people on the earth may not even think is possible to, for that person to become. Now, let's look at a couple of things we can learn from this text. I'll start with uh, picking up a few things from the various verses before coming to concentrate a bit more on this aspect of love, because love is wonderful, is paramount, and there are many things that were laid on my mind as I prepare this. I don't know how many of them I'm going to be able to share. Some of them are not in the outline here, but if God gave me the, the, the ability, the utterance, I would be able to share things that will challenge us and move us into really loving and showing love to one another. The first thing I notice here is that Jesus visited uh, uh, Simon the leper. This person is called Simon the leper. Now, uh, you know, when I read that, uh, 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 that was the first message that spoke to me. 
And now we are not told whether this Simon the leper was previously a leprous person that Jesus healed and because of that, invited Jesus Christ to his house or Jesus went to his house for follow-up uh, to see uh, uh, him. You know, sometimes even after a person has been healed like that, uh, because the person was notoriously known as a leper, they may still keep on using that word, Simon the leper. Well, if he was not healed, well, Jesus Christ going to visit him on this day would have brought that healing because Jesus never go to a place and leave the person uh, in the same condition he was. Every sick person that came to Jesus was healed. Every infirm individual was made whole. And today, Jesus can heal you. Jesus can make you whole of any sickness. In those days, leprosy was incurable. But all the lepers that came to Jesus Jesus healed them. So this man is described as Simon the leper. I mean, to think of Jesus Christ going to the house of a person that was described as Simon the leper. You know, it, it, it has like a stigma. To call him Simon the leper brings a kind of stigma. Oh, man of God, you shouldn't go there. Even if he was healed, the house may be contaminated. You can uh, 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 get a part of that sickness. No, sickness doesn't uh, 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 transmit onto the Lord Jesus Christ. And when people believe in God, know God, serve God with their heart and their mind, the power of God comes upon them. And any sickness, plague that is taking place anywhere, if it comes on the body of that individual, that plague will die. Those virus will die. I read a story some time ago about uh, a man. I can't remember. I think it was John G. Lake, if not mistaken, or another individual like that. He was a mighty man of God, a preacher. He traveled to southern part of Africa where there was a very serious plague at that time. And anybody that the plague comes upon, they will vomit, they will, all sorts of things, symptoms will take place and they will die within a few days. This man felt the call of God. He said, I must go then to pray for the sick and to, uh, to uh, uh, let God touch these people and heal them. Well, many people would have been scared about that. They would have thought that, well, this person is out of his mind. You are going to die within a few days of getting them. But this man was not moved. He went over, traveled to that place. And when he got there, they warned him, this sickness, this virus is too contagious. If you get near the people, you are going to catch it. And this man of God said, go and bring the saliva of people that have this sickness. Because the James were in the saliva. And they brought the saliva. And the man says, look in the microscope. Can you see the virus? They said, yes. The virus are moving here and there and so on. He says, put that saliva on my hand. And they put it on his hand. He says, use your microscope and look at what happens to the virus. And when they looked, they saw all the virus were dead. They were no longer moving, no longer doing anything. That was the faith of this man of God. That if any germ or disease come or touch me, it's going to die. And that man stayed there, lived there, and ministered to those people, and they were healed. Brethren, we need to come to that point where we really believe God, where we really trust in the power of God. Of course, we are not saying we should become careless and carefree and ignore medical regulations like uh, maybe uh, um, uh, different kinds of regulations for different kinds of diseases. Uh, no, we still have to observe all those things, get medical treatment when it is necessary. Uh, but let's understand there is power to heal power, to uh, 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 set the captives free. So Jesus did not allow stigma to uh, affect his ministerial work. He went to visit Simon the leper. He wasn't afraid that the leprosy will get transmitted to him. He wasn't afraid that uh, uh, people will now run away from him because he has been with a leper. You know, in those days, if you got close to somebody that was unclean, the lep le 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 lepers were unclean people. 
you were supposed to separate yourself, become unclean, and then wash your clothes and this thing. All those are good hygiene. And we still need to observe all those things even till today. That is why when the current pandemic, uh, uh, COVID-19 came, uh, 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 that took place, people were, decide, uh, were, were required to keep social distance, to wash their hands regularly. That was still in line with some of the Old Testament laws that were in the Bible concerning uh, uh, infectious diseases. And now D Jesus Christ went there. He, he, he associated with this person. Jesus went there because he wanted to touch the heart of this person. Effectiveness in saving souls requires willingness to associate as that opens the door of their heart to the gospel. It also requires faith for divine protection in every circumstance. So let's have that faith. Let's believe in God and let's uh, uh, trust in the Lord and God will do it for us in Jesus name. Now, we are told in that uh, passage of scripture that Jesus Christ not only went to visit this man in his house, but he was sitting at meal. Jesus, are you not afraid that if you eat a meal that is prepared in the place where there was leprosy, that that meal might be contaminated and so on? Oh, no, Jesus sat at meal in that particular house. He was trying to show that he accepts this person, he accepts these people, and this would have opened the heart of this man to fellowship, to love, to respond to God, and many other uh, things. Now, we are told as this was taking place, a woman came uh, into that house. Now, we are not told that this woman went into the temple. Jesus Christ went to the temple many times to preach, Jesus Christ went to synagogue to read the Bible, to uh, fellowship with other people, and to carry out. Jesus Christ taught in many places where there were big crowds. Maybe this woman didn't have opportunity. He knew if he went near the temple, the religious allies, the priests, and the Pharisees will not allow him to get near to Jesus Christ, will not allow him to enter those places. So he stayed away where he would not have access to Jesus Christ. But then when he heard, when she knew that Jesus has entered into the house of a common, a common person, a common individual, the house of Simon the leper, he, he, she immediately saw, this is my opportunity. Not many people will come, want to come to this type of house. There may not be a large crowd here that prevent me from getting in and uh, uh, getting access to Jesus Christ. So she used that opportunity. She did not waste. Opportunity knocks but once. We need to keep our eyes open for opportunities. And um, as we see those opportunities, we must need to make good use of it. You know, Jesus was inside a house. This is a private house, a personal house belonging to somebody. This woman could have said, if I go into that house, maybe people will think, oh, may begin to think he went there to have an affair with Jesus Christ. Maybe they use one of the room for this and that. This woman did not allow what other people may think about her to influence her, to uh, stop her from going. Yes, it, the Bible tells us clearly we should avoid all appearances of sin. We are not saying people should live in a careless manner that will cram, make other people to reach a wrong uh, 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 interpretation and maybe influence the gospel negatively. Obviously, Jesus and Simon were not the only people in this house. Uh, because the disciples were there, we are told. Uh, but this woman saw that as an opportunity to go with this small crowd, uh, where there was a small crowd, so that he can gain access to the Lord Jesus Christ. He wasn't thinking of uh, what people will say. You see, sometimes it is the fear of what people will think, what people will say that is actually preventing us from doing what we should be doing. The Bible tells us in 1 John chapter 4, verse 18, that there is no fear in love, but perfect love casted out all fear. So we need to operate under the perfect love of God. And with the, uh, that kind of operation, we will not be afraid what people will say, what people will think. We will do what we know is right 
uh, knowing that God tells us to do that very thing. When you think of prophet uh, uh, Elijah, for example, there was something God told him to do, which if Elijah was just thinking normally as a normal human being, he would probably have said, no, God, I cannot do this because people will say this, people will say that. You remember the time I, uh, Elijah gave the word, there will be no rain except by my word. And there was famine in Israel. The first thing God told him to do, go and stay by the brook. I will send a bed to feed you there and you will drink of that water. Eventually the water in the brook dried up and God told her, go to Sarephat. Uh, because I have prepared a widow woman to take care of you in that place. Do you know, in those days in Israel, I mean, think about, I think it was last Sunday somebody mentioned uh, uh, during the service uh, about the story, uh, the woman of Samaria by the well, that when the disciples of Jesus Christ came back, it was an open place. They saw Jesus talking with the woman and the disciples were like uncomfortable, but maybe out of respect, they kept their mouth shut because they were wondering how could Jesus, the Messiah, be speaking to a woman and a woman in a public. It was a kind of thing you should not do. People will read different kind of meanings into it, but Jesus Christ ignored all of that. He was talking with the woman. Eventually, that woman became the conduit or the source of bringing that city to salvation. So when God told Elijah, go to Sarephat, uh, because I prepared a widow woman, Elijah could have said, eh, a widow woman? That means that woman lives alone. If somebody finds me, entering into the house of a widow woman, what will they think? They will think you are going there to mess up. You are going there. Uh, the news will spread. Newspaper will carry it if it were today. Front page newspaper. Oh, a prophet uh, is having an affair in the house of a widow and, and all those kind of things. But Elijah didn't ask any question. He didn't react negatively to what God said. He simply obeyed. And that is where the miracle took place. So we must learn to take step as God wants us to take step. Do what God tells us to do, irrespective of what other people may say or think. Leave the consequences to God. God knows how to handle those consequences. Now, she came with an ointment. The ointment she used on Jesus was not a cheap one, but was described as precious ointment and it was the type that provoked the disciples to such indignation that they question in verse 8 to what purpose is this waste why do you carry out such a waste like this so this woman took something that was valuable to her it wasn't something cheap you know sometimes when we want to do something for god we are looking for something cheap Sometimes when people want to go to church and they know that there are going to be offerings, offerings are going to be collected in the church, they start looking for coins, for change. Uh, they've got notes. They say, no, I can't give this note. It's too much. I can't give that one. It's too big. I want to find a change. They go there, look for a change. Ask somebody there, do you have change? Do you? Because they want to put something very small. That wasn't the case for this woman. No, this woman wanted to give the best. She wanted to give the greatest. She wanted to give something that touched her, something that caused her, not just the leftovers. Brethren, we need to ask ourselves, how do we approach God? How do we approach the things of God? Now, these disciples considered this to be a great waste. To what purpose? That's the question they ask. What purpose? What reason? What justification do you have for such a waste like this? And to justify their criticism, they pointed out that the ointment might have been sold for so much and the prophecies given to the poor. Oh, the question is, Peter, James, John, and all the disciples, when you were coming here, did you not see the poor? Did you not have something you could give to the poor? Why are you just at, why is it only the ointment of this woman that needs to be sold to give to the poor? 
Why couldn't you get things from other places to give to the poor? Well, people will always find justification uh, for whatever criticisms they want to bring. Maybe against the church, against the pastor, against the members in the church, or against some acts of benevolence that is being done in the name of the Lord. But Jesus Christ saw beyond the affected. He saw beyond the, the words, the empty words they were speaking, and Jesus called them down. Jesus says, why trouble the, the, uh, the woman? For she had wrought a good work upon me. For ye have the poor always with you. The poor have always been there before I came. The poor are there right now. The poor will continue to be after I have gone. But you won't have me always with you. For in that she has poured this ointment on my body, she did it for my burial. Jesus explained. Many of them didn't think about the burial of Jesus Christ that was coming. Jesus talked about it. They didn't understand. Peter even rebuked him. Master, you are not going to die. They never uh, want Jesus Christ to die. But uh, this woman, whether she understood it or not, you know, sometimes you do things you don't really understand, but prophetically, you are led by God to do what is right. So she was led by God to bring the ointment to anoint Jesus in preparation for his burial. And Jesus acknowledged it. Jesus protected her. Jesus defended her action. You see, uh, if this woman was afraid of what people will say and therefore did not do what she wanted to do, she would not have got this uh, to this point where Jesus Christ defended her action, where Jesus Christ uh, uh, now used her action to explain uh, what is coming next. Now, God never allows good work with the right intentions to go unrewarded. I think this is one of the key messages you need to bear in mind today. That whatever you do, whatever good work that you do, God will not allow it to go unrecognized, unrewarded. Uh, the Bible says that God is not un unfaithful to forget your labor of love. What you have done for the saints and for other people, God will reward in. I mean, God saw what this woman has done. This selfless act of true love and adoration received a fitting memorial as a reward, not just for that day alone, but Jesus said throughout all the world, anywhere the gospel is going to be preached, if Jesus tarries for another thousand years, this will continue to be mentioned anywhere the gospel is preached. What a fitting memorial that Jesus Christ, that God bestowed upon this woman because of uh, the love that she showed to the Lord Jesus Christ. When this woman brought the ointment to pour on Jesus Christ, she was not thinking along this line. She was not thinking of getting this type of reward. She was not thinking of uh, being in the record book where other people will come to know uh, her. She was just doing something out of the fullness of the love of God in her heart. Now, every day in life, we are presented with many opportunities of showing love uh, to Jesus Christ through the people that we mean. When you read the story in Matthew chapter 25, verse 31 to 46, how Jesus Christ uh, sat on the throne and everybody was scattered and he divides them into two groups like a shepherd divides the goat from the sheep. And he will tell the sheep, I was hungry, you fed me. I was naked, you clothed me. I was in hospital, you visited me and so on and so forth. And they said, Jesus, when did we see you in any of these situations? And we did that to you, Jesus answered, as long as you did it to any one of the least of my brethren, you did it to me. So this tells us we also have opportunity in this world to show love to other people that we meet. Of course, there are many people that abuse that opportunity and just want to uh, maybe uh, uh, um, abuse the opportunity to get things from us. But there are other people in genuine need in various places all over the world. And you can be a channel to help meet the needs of those people. There are many organizations that specialize 
in helping uh, people in uh, persecuted believers or people in poor countries, helping them there with the basic needs of life. And you have access, you can contribute to such a thing. And when you do it from your heart, because you want to meet the needs of those people, you want to support the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ and God sees it, God will reward you abundantly. So you need to make the best use of your opportunities. And in 1 John chapter 3, verse 18, the Bible tells us, my little children, let us not love in word, neither in tongue, but in deed and in truth. In other words, put action to your word. Don't just say, I love you. You know, it's very common these days. You go to the shop to buy something. Uh, how much does this cost? Oh, it's 10 pence love. It's five pence love. Uh, love is becoming so uh, this and that. And they use it for selling things. But the person that says love, love, love like that can turn around. The moment you turn back, he starts abusing you, talking negative things against you because it is not true love. They just use it as a kind of advertisement uh, to uh, sell things, to get customers and to get all those things. Brethren, we are talking about a memorial of love. And I want to uh, challenge every one of us that this is the most important thing that we need to consider and practice. You remember in Exodus 20, when God gave the 10 commandments, he started with love, love God with all your heart. He started with, uh, when they asked Jesus Christ, what is the greatest commandment in the Bible? Jesus says, the greatest commandment is love God with all your heart. And he says, the second is like unto the first, love your neighbor, love other people as you love yourself. Or he says, on these two commandments, hang all the laws and the prophets. In other words, every law that has been made, every uh, uh, prophetic declaration, every teaching in the, uh, uh, that people use to tell people do this and do that, if only you demonstrate love for God and love for human beings, it's going to make you fulfill all the commandments of God. And so love is number one. Love is important. Love is vital. But can I ask you the question, do you love God? The Bible says, if you don't love one another, the people on earth that you see, how can you love God that you don't see? The Bible tells us that, we need, that our body is the temple of the Holy Spirit where God dwells and works. The question, therefore, I want to ask you, do you love God? If your answer is yes, how do you keep your body? Is your body, are you making your body, your temple, to be a holy place where God can come in and dwell and, and, and be happy with you? Are you careless with your body? Do you put into your body substance that can damage you, that can destroy you? that can do all these kind of things to you? Do you do all those things? If you do them, then you don't love your body. There are many things that people do. I mean, when I was a small child, before I started primary school, that tells you I was really small and young at that time. I wasn't born again. I didn't know all the things that I know today. <clears throat> One of the things I did as a small child is I recognized that people like to smoke cigarettes. And that if you sell cigarettes, you can make a lot of money. And you know, as a small child, not old enough to start primary school. Uh, in those days, you only start primary school when you are seven years of age. And so as a small boy that was not old enough to start primary school, I decided to be selling things. And what was one of the things I sold? I sold cigarettes uh, because I felt I could make a lot of money out of it. People came and, and bought. Well, my parents would not allow me to smoke uh, the, the, the cigarette uh, because uh, they knew it wasn't good. And I sold them uh, to other people just to make money. But you know, as I grew up, I became a Christian at a teenage, uh, when I was a teenager. From that time on, I knew that 
things like uh, 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 that thing, uh, uh, cigarette, were bad. They damaged the body. And of course, I had stopped selling everything at that time because I was studying. Uh, uh, but if I were to be doing trading at that time, I definitely would not sell cigarette. I definitely would not sell anything that will damage the body. Do you love God? If you love God, is that reflected in your love for yourself? So put it the other way. Do you love yourself? This woman loved herself. That is why he had, she had the confidence and the boldness to come to Jesus Christ. You know, if you don't love yourself, you won't appreciate yourself. You won't want to come near to the Lord Jesus Christ. You will see yourself as this, as that, and, and, and unworthy, and so on. But you need to love yourself. When you love yourself, you will take care of yourself. You will take care of your health. You will treat yourself. If there is sickness on, on your body, you will do anything to heal yourself, to cure yourself. And you come across uh, a, a lot of people, ministers in the gospel that had real anointing and power. Uh, they preach and pray and people get healed. Uh, people like Catherine Kuhlman who has died and gone to be with the Lord. She was a mighty preacher of the gospel. Spectacular miracles took place in her ministry. People like Benny Hinn, she is still alive, still preaching the gospel. Spectacular miracles take place in his name. But do you know one thing in common about these two people? These people, they, they told people, their congregation, if I pray for you and the sickness does not go away, please immediately go and look for the best doctor in the world and let that doctor treat you. Let that doctor cure you. Recently, I was listening to Benny Hinn uh, preaching. Uh, he went to preach in the uh, daughter's church. Uh, 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 and when he got there, I said he's so happy with the son-in-law because the son-in-law listened to his advice. That son-in-law, when he was a small child, had incurable disease. Doctors gave up. They, they, they never thought he would live. And he came to Benihim's program. Benihim prayed for him and he was healed instantaneously till today. He grew up. He, he was just a small boy at that time when he used to go to that uh, church. Uh, but now he's grown up an adult, married the daughter, and they've got grown up children. And he says, this man was unwell. I don't know what the sickness was. I believe Benihim would have prayed for him. And Benihim spoke to him and said, go to the doctor. He didn't want to go. He wanted to just depend on healing by faith only. But Benihim said, go to the doctor. And he went to the doctor. Oppression was carried out. I don't know what the, the issue was. And now he has recovered. He's preaching again. He's carrying on. That, I mean, if he didn't go to the doctor and became incapacitated with that sickness, would he be able to preach the gospel? Many people will lose the opportunity of hearing the gospel because somebody is, doesn't love himself. He's not taking good care of himself. And this is, God wants us to take good care of ourselves in every area. Whatever you know will be good for you, will be good for other people. You need to do it. And uh, allow the love of God to flow through you and flow through to other people. You see, when you love other people, you won't do anything that is going to damage that person, that is going to offend that person. You want to do something that is going to please that person, that is going to help and encourage that person. You will be careful in your action. You won't just become lecanistic. Uh, oh, this is this, this is that. Last Sunday, the children at the youth uh, shared something from a book about a man, and the man was talking about uh, when they got married, uh, uh, got married to, 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 to the wife. They went to the altar and they made all those declarations. Uh, you know the declaration, will you take this law? Those were like the rules. And I said, yes, I do, yes, I do. And he says, after that, they got home and he says, the wife started coming up with some new regulation new rules in the house, things that they were not mentioned during the marriage vows. 
For example, the wife said, after using the toilet, you must close the, co the, the cover of the toilet. And the wife said something else, uh, I, 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 you mustn't grow hair on the back. I don't like people that grow hair on the back. Uh, you mustn't do this. And he says, well, at first she was wondering, uh, he was wondering, he the man, well, is that what we are uh, signed up to? Is that what we are agreed? And uh, as a man, he could have just revolted against all those things and said, no, uh, show me any passage in the Bible that says when you go to toilet, you must close the toilet seat. Show me a passage in the Bible that says you mustn't have a hair on your back. Show me a passage in the Bible that says this uh, such and such should not take place before uh, early in the, before 10 o'clock in the morning and so on. But the man said, after thinking about all those things, he told himself, mm -mm, I love my wife. I want her to be happy. And so for good relations to exist, I will do this thing. He found it easy to do those things because there is love. You see, when there is love, anything that other people want you to do that is not sinful, this is a key point you need to note. It's not that you are now trying to please somebody and do something that you know from the word of God is wrong. And that will be compromised. That is how Solomon uh, 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 lost his relationship with God and backslided because Solomon wanted to please the foreign women. He went on to build altars for all the foreign gods that they brought in and he lost his standing with God and God became angry with him. We're not talking about those kinds of things. But if it is just ordinary things like all these, uh, minor things that are neither sinful or these neutral things you can bend you can uh, 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 bow you can submit he said out of love she did all those things so as to maintain good relationship the question is where do you love yourself do you love other people the people that you see the people that you live with because the bible tells us don't tell me you love god if you cannot love other human beings, your brother that you see every day, your children you live in the same house with, your wife you live together in the same house, your husband that you live together in the same house, uh, your parents that you live together in the same house, if you cannot show love to them, if you cannot bend here, bend them for the sake of peace, good relationships and everything, don't tell me that you love God. There is no love of God in your heart, in your mind. And today the Lord has spoken to us about love. Uh, 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 you see, when you come out like that with love, there will be fellowship. There will be joy. The Bible tells us in Psalm 133, how pleasant is it when brethren dwell together in peace, in fellowship, in love, in unity, because there the Lord commands his, uh, his blessing. God will command the blessing. The blessing could be healing. It could be power it could be anything whatever you need brethren let's go to the lord now in prayer and say god give me a heart to love a heart to love myself to love other people that i can see and to love god so that i i can do work that is acceptable unto you in jesus name let us pray